We got another great speaker for you, um, uh, Navjot Singh. I told you I could pronounce it. <laughs> Navjot Singh is uh, a managing uh, is the uh, managing partner of McKinsey's Boston office. And before you uh, start throwing tomatoes at me for inviting a consultant, um, I will tell you that Navjot has 15 patents in material science and engineering. Um, he was, a, he was a, an inventor and, a, and an entrepreneur before joining McKinsey about 15 years ago, and before that he was at GE. So he brings a wealth of experience, not only um, on the engineering side, but also on public policy um, and working with the social and private sector. So again, sticking with our theme of polymaths who have cross-functional roles and are able to bring people from diverse interests together around common goals. Please welcome Navjot. <laughs> My, my, my biggest problem with my name is that uh, I'm into basketball and I'm pretty short uh, in terms of being uh, like center and uh, people never pass the ball to me. So I said, call me Nav and give me the ball. <laughs> so I think uh, if you can't pronounce my name, Nav Singh is just, is just fine. Uh, I will not talk about DC today. I will not talk about regulations today. If you ask me questions, I'll respond, but I won't. Uh, because I like, believe innovation happens. And uh, this is a place where it happens. This is an amazing place. Uh, Boston's an amazing place. US is an amazing place and will always be. I believe in that. I'm a perpetual optimist. Uh, I was talking to my son, who's a teen, 13 year old, and we were debating uh, the courses he was taking. And uh, he's uh, into history. And I said, Why are you studying about history? Let's talk with the future. And of course, we were having a good debate about that. And we we're talking about the big disruptions in history. Uh, People, we talked about electricity, we talked about the light bulb, uh, we talked about stock market, we talked about the banking system, we talked about the constitution, we talked about many things. Uh, and then uh, we began to talk about which civilization or which empire uh, really changed the world or had the biggest contributions, and we debated many of them. Uh, but the one that jumped to our mind, and he's a Roman history uh, geek at times, uh, was the Roman Empire. And if you think about the Roman Empire at that time, uh, the, amount of, uh, the amount of contributions that it made and the actual innovations that came out of that are just amazing. So for those of you who may not know, uh, the sewers, the, 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 the aqueducts, medicine, the Roman numerals, newspapers, were all invented around, around, around that time, which we all remember for. Now, some of us will say, this is old economy. We don't talk about sewers and aqueducts and all that, and that is true. We talk about Mars, we talk about space, uh, we talk about drones, we talk about all kinds of amazing things. But if you look back and say, how come one society in 250 or 300 years was able to contribute so much? And the one thesis out there, it's about openness. It's about openness to ideas, it's about investments. It's about being able to gather a group of people together and make new things happen and having the pride, the courage uh, to be able to do all of this. This is in contrast with other parts of the world where at the same time, uh, 250 years, and I won't name which ones, uh, some of the progress was not as great, uh, at least on the whole, on the whole like, innovation side. Here is a, uh, here's a cup, uh, and there are two cups, uh, which were uh, 250 years apart. Uh, and they don't have as much to contribute in terms of, uh, or as much to talk about in terms of the actual innovation. Of course, you would say one of them is blue, one of them is nice, and it depends upon the other of the beholder. Uh, but their focus was much more on their culture and being much more closed. And uh, we would argue that openness does matter, and it is one of the key components of driving innovation, diversity, and bringing all kinds of ideas in uh, to, make things, to make things happen, and then investing at scale. Now, this is the last place I want to come and talk about innovation, uh, because you guys are the heartbeat and the whole, uh, uh, and the whole like, epicenter of that. Uh, I did at some point toy about the idea of writing a book on innovation. And I quickly went onto Amazon and did a search. Can anybody guess how many books on innovation are there on Amazon? Any guess? 60,000. 60,000. You're close. It's 350,000. <laughs> they will teach you. So if you ever want to learn, 
please pick up one of these books or a few of these books. You can spend your whole life reading about innovation. Uh, so I will not complicate by another perspectives and ideas and thoughts, uh, but uh, uh, I will definitely not write a book. Uh, but I think it's useful to reflect on three or four trends that are shaping the world right now, which we are enthusiastic about. Uh, first is uh, data edge and platforms. And of course, when you talk about data, everybody talks about Google and Facebook and everything else. But in the old industry, I'm an engineer. In the old industrial world, data has changed the world in massive ways. Look at agriculture. John Deere out here, uh, it's just not about tractors that mow or, or just har harvest. They've got sensors on them. They've got sensors that can sense the soil temperature, moisture, nutrients, which can go up to apps. And you can have the scientists analyze them. And you can figure out what is going on. Uh, and you can come up with precision agriculture. Uh, this is something that would not have happened a long time ago. My favorite is working with a pulp and paper car company. They buy wood all the time. I mean, you can't make paper without buying wood. Now, how do you bring innovation to them? Now, uh, what we found was we went in to do some procurement work with them, and we found that the price versus volume curve is flat. And you guys are like Sloanies out here, and you know, price versus volume curve being flat is, is rare. And we said, why is that going on? And then we dug in and dug in and dug in and looked at years and decades of data that they had. And what we found was it depends on multiple reasons. It depends on the type of the wood. It depends on how many mills are there. It depends upon the temperature of the day. It depends on the slush on the ground because somebody has to fall the tree and bring it out. It depends upon where it was like fallen. And then it also depends upon the driver who's driving the wood into the, sh into the mill, and they look at the inventory levels that are open, and if the inventory is slight, they jack up the price. If the inventory is high, they bring the price down. And hence, price versus volume is flat. So what we did was we applied artificial in intelligence, and, uh, we were, uh, and we were able to model uh, uh, 110 different nodes that depending upon this type of wood, depending on this different type of the day, here is the right price you should be paying. And now there's an app that the buyers have that as the truck drives in, they can enter a few things and they know what should be the right price they should be paying. So while we all get enamored by the fancy stuff, even in the old economy, there are massive changes that are happening and data and platform does matter and how do you leverage that counts a lot. Next one is uh, IP and of course, uh, Intellectual property does matter a lot. By the way, in the context of 350,000 books on innovation, does anybody know how many US patents a year? How many US patents get, get, get filed? 600,000. Bang on, 550,000 a year. And if anybody uh, likes to really read, I would say read a patent. Look at the claims. They are much more useful at times. And look at what is going on and focus on the actual inventions of interest. Because if you think you have a good idea, most likely it has been invented before. I can guarantee you that. Uh, and if it does not, please file your IP. Uh, but the reason why I, uh, we actually talk about this is it's about, about, uh, about like partnerships. It's just on the IP. This is what we live living in where partnerships matter a lot. Uh, we I just have one case example here, BMW, Audi, and uh, uh, Daimler, Daimler. Uh, just imagine Google and Apple controlling the interface in terms of maps. If you're into automotive, uh, imagine the amount of data uh, that, uh, that resides right there. And they chose to invest in a Nokia, like that's been out here, to be able to get access to a mapping software. Now, imagine three major players putting the resources together and going after a very different type of partnership. Um, I live in the pharmaceutical world, uh, live with a lot of biotechs. If you look at uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, almost 60% of the pipeline of large pharma originated from somewhere else. 60% of the late stage pipeline is coming from elsewhere. So partnerships are becoming even more critical. Uh, I'm sure you, all of you like to play with the Legos or your kids. I hope so. 
uh, I had the pleasure of uh, witnessing a speech from the Lego Lexi at one of our Le conferences. He's also a McKinsey alum, and uh, he really is enjoying himself. But I think the few things I picked away from that was uh, they're just focused on one big thing, right? It is not about 100 different things that they're doing. But the amount of research that they're doing around the neurological aspects of that for kids is just mind-blowing. Uh, but they're also mining the, the crowds. Uh, have you guys uh, been to a Lego site and contributed any, any like, ideas yet? Uh, if you have not, maybe you should. Uh, because if your idea uh, is liked by other people, and I, think, I think there's 10,000 people, they may take it up, and then they may commercialize it. And if, if that happens, one percent of, of their sales are yours. And uh, some of the best uh, of Lego have come from ideas that were crowdsourced. Now, you don't think about Lego and the crowdsourcing because of many other things you talk about, but crowdsourcing is happening in the old economy also in massive ways. And I'm not saying Lego is old, it's an actual old economy, but crowdsourcing has become a very critical part of it. Uh, and then the speed of, uh, the speed at which we're working. So there's like satellite on the left, uh, it takes one to three years to build. Now, one web is talking about making in one to three days. Have you guys heard of one web here? Uh, they're talking about putting 900 satellites up, uh, which are made at this space so that they can cover almost the whole world. So you, if you've seen the like, Verizon ads, can you hear me, can you hear me, can you hear me, will almost not be required. Because uh, if, that, if that works, uh, they will just transform the whole place. And they can put many more likes on satellites in a very short time. And this is a major innovation. I didn't put, pick Uber and others because you all know about, about that. But in the old engineering uh, way, there are massive innovations that are going on. So uh, how are we applying this to at McKinsey? Uh, McKinsey uh, was founded almost 90 years ago. Uh, by James O. McKinsey, uh, who unfortunately passed away in uh, uh, almost eight years afterwards. Uh, and then uh, Marvin Bauer on the left, like steered us for the longest time. And Marvin uh, really got us focused on our values. And our values are about impact and about great people. And hence, we want the world's best people, and we'll fight for them. And uh, we want to focus on sustainable client impact. And those values have not changed and will never change for us. We, in fact, spent a full day talking about those uh, because that's our core. But what we've added on, what you may not know, is, uh, is uh, that uh, we have uh, ongoing effort on what we call making deep ventures for the longest time, where we are venturing a lot more. Uh, we have made uh, almost uh, 13 acquisitions, five equity stakes. Uh, we have uh, uh, invested in design. We are the fourth largest design firm right now. We have 800 data-like scientists. Uh, we have some of the best platforms there. Uh, we have an annual uh, or a biannual venture compilation where our 14,000 folks uh, who are just amazing, we hire some of the very best. If they have an idea, they can contribute to it, and we fund some of them, and there are eight client experiments ongoing. Uh, so McKinsey evolves in very, is just evolving in massive ways. And if you just thought about McKinsey as a place where you make PowerPoint slides, uh, likely you, you don't know what we are today. Okay. Uh, but as we went on this journey ourselves, there were some lessons learned, which I think are relevant for uh, the broader topic here. One is, uh, how do you stay true to your core? What is your core? Our values are our core. Impact is core. You don't need PowerPoint slides for impact. You need impact for impact. <laughs> and how to drive the impact, and how do you not deviate from that? And how do you have the top CEO mindset while you're driving all of, all of this change? Uh, that was one of the, one, that is one of the critical issues that, that we have, have right now, okay? And we'll keep working on, on that. We've come a long way, uh, but that is always a question that people ask. And I think that's true for any company also as to what is our core and what do we want to do. Uh, next one is, how do you trial and error at speed? How do you get multiple experiments going? Because by the time you build a business plan, in my mind, I'm sure these, you all are VVCs, you worry about, about, about plans. Plans, I can assure you, in the VC stage are likely wrong because things evolve so much. By the time you build a plan and you have all of these things, things have evolved rapidly. Uh, how do you just get going? So we want to create an infrastructure where if you have an idea, just go do it. 
In fact, in the Boston office, we often say there's a 90% chance we will not say no, so why do you even ask? Just go do it. Uh, and uh, if it works, great, we'll make you a hero. If it fails, go on to the next, next experiment. But how do you experiment at speed matters a lot. And people will often say, oh, we don't want to have 1,000 flowers bloom. You know what? No one has 1,000 flowers that are good flowers. Uh, people have ideas, but they're not flowers yet. Uh, I would be fine with 1,000 flowers. There are hardly uh, 50 or 100, 100 flowers, right? Uh, but you don't want to have, um, you don't want to have, have, like, have that randomness, but you do want creativity. You, you want people to go off and actually experiment. Uh, last, last one is, uh, look, it's all about people. And this is our design team over here. Uh, and you wouldn't have thought McKinsey is a place that where happens, but I would say like innovation is all about people. Uh, people talk about Apple, I think about Steve Jobs. Uh, people talk about Microsoft, I think about Bill Gates. There were some big innovators that made things happen, and those guys often have the track record also, they keep doing it again and again. So attracting the right talent, and I would say there are three groups of those. There's a zero to one who can bring an idea from an idea stage to making it somewhat real. Then we call it one to 10 that can make it from 1% 1, 1 to like 10% of opportunity. Far tougher, but uh, you can do that too. 10 to 100 is the easier one. And how in an organization can you groom the 0 to 1 and the 1 to 10s and take care of them? Uh, that is a big, a big issue we have. So uh, I think all I would like to close uh, by saying is that I think the question should be asking is, are you worrying about data? and how you taking care of that, what type of partnerships you are talking about, how are you crowdsourcing these ideas, how do you go off and uh, move at speed because you likely be disrupted, and uh, how do you stay to your core, and how do you uh, experiment with speed, and also uh, how do you attract the very, very best people because it's all about people. So on that note, I will uh, end to say I hope uh, we will be remembered uh, for being Boston and just not Rome, and uh, we'll be remembered for going to Mars, and that is what history is going to write about us. Thank you. Thank you.